Well, good morning. Aren't you grateful today that we are serving the God who conquered the grave? We are praising the one who walked out of an empty tomb. We are praising the one who rose to life to offer us freedom. If you're grateful for that today, let me hear you say yes. My name is, yeah, go ahead. My name is Aaron and I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm so grateful that we are continuing in our message series called Resilient. As we ask the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus in a world that is falling apart? And today we're continuing as we study the book of 2 Peter chapter two. And I can't wait to dive in. I believe that God rose to life to offer you an existence like any other. I believe that God wants you to live a life filled with fullness and joy. I think that's the best idea the world has ever heard. But today I want to talk about the kinds of ideas that can get in the way of the life that God has for us. Today I want to talk about the hidden danger of bad ideas. As you look around the world, I bet it doesn't take very long for you to notice a few bad ideas. But I wanna talk about the other kind of ideas. Have you ever had a good idea go wrong? A couple of weeks ago, this happened to me. I was sitting out in my backyard, looking out over my yard, and I noticed the, the hill behind our house was starting to bother me. So it was filled with pine straw and beautiful shrubs and weeds, so many weeds. And I just started to uh, get angrier and angrier. And so I went to the backyard and I started pulling a few and I just noticed like this task was bigger than I originally imagined. It was in that moment I knew I wanted to declare war on the weeds. So I went to Home Depot and I just like bust in the door. I'm like, give me the strongest stuff you got. And they're showing me the regular weed spray. I'm like, I don't want that. I want something where the warning label is bigger than the regular label. I want something with skull and crossbones. And they're like, we've got something in the back. So I go home with my artillery. I load it up in my sprayer. And for two hours, I'm out there spraying like an American. I felt awesome. <laughs> One thing I didn't notice till about halfway through is that it was a pretty windy day. And the wind was blowing these chemicals back up into my face. It was around that moment I thought for a second, did I read the instructions? It doesn't matter. This is weed spray and I'm a human. So I finished I was sitting on my back patio, admiring my work, drinking a sweet tea like you do in the USA, in the South, (laughs) amen. And it was right then that I noticed a splitting headache was starting to take hold of my head. I thought, you know what, it's Saturday. I'm gonna go to sleep and tomorrow I'll wake up and be fine because it's Sunday. Sunday is God's day. So I did. I went to sleep and I woke up and the headache was worse. (laughs) In fact, it was starting to hurt in parts of my brain I didn't realize I had. So I brushed it off like you do because I was getting ready for church. And it was while I was getting ready for church, I noticed that my lungs were burning. But ever the optimist, I said, it only really hurts when I breathe, it's fine. I was teaching in church that day. You're like, what, was I there? Don't worry, don't worry. I was just teaching in the kids ministry. (laughs) That day I was under the influence of the Holy Spirit and the chemical I've come to know as Diquat. It was right in the middle of the second service when the dizziness started to kick in. I drove myself home and on the drive, that's when the disillusionment and disorientation started to kick in. It's when I opened the front door and the nosebleeds began that I realized I should probably call someone. See, everything is fun and games until the guy at poison control seems alarmed. (laughs) I did. Thanks, son. He was there. Daddy's got it from here. (laughs) For one shining moment though, oh, by the way, I'm fine and the weeds are back. (laughs) 
But for one shining moment, I had a broken body, but a beautiful yard. And my neighbor came over during that brief glimmer of time. And he said, Aaron, wow, your yard looks good. I said, no, Dave, it's not just good. It's killer. (laughs) And I learned an important truth that bad ideas about little things can be disappointing, but bad ideas about big things can be deadly. You see, the reason we have these problems to begin with is long ago in a perfect place, in a perfect garden, in perfect fellowship with God, where people were living out his perfect plans for their lives, everything went wrong when two people believed a bad idea. I wonder what kind of bad ideas could be holding you back today. I wonder what kind of bad ideas could be stealing God's best for your life. The kindest thing you could do for yourself is to give it a look. I learned from science and um, just studying neurology and neurobiology and anthropology that humans are social creatures. And we find that ideas spread socially. In fact, human beings are addicted to ideas, and that's why influence shapes the world, especially in this upcoming political season. Billions of dollars are going to be spent to shape your ideas, the ideas you have about the little things, but the ideas you have about very big things. And if you want to seize the life God really has for you, maybe the most important question you could be asking is this, who influences you? Where do you go to shape your ideas about eternity, about love, about God? According to the scripture and what we're gonna see today, the stakes couldn't be any higher. The book of 2 Peter is a really fascinating piece of scripture. We know that the Bible was a real text written to real people on a real walk with God. And the book of 2 Peter is no different. It was written by perhaps Jesus' most famous disciple. He was the man who walked on water. Peter was a man who felt the heartbreak and loss as he heard himself deny Jesus three times. Peter was a man who watched his best friend stretch out his arms and give his life in a public display. But Peter was also the man who saw the king of kings after he had walked out of an empty grave. And this is Peter's dying letter. He doesn't have long left. And he wants to leave a final message And this is a man that doesn't follow Jesus because he thinks that he should. He follows Jesus to the end, giving his life for what he believes because after seeing everything there was to see about Jesus, he found that nothing compares to him because he is so very good. Jesus follows, Peter follows Jesus because he's seen Jesus change everything and because he believes the promise of Jesus. And if you're just checking things out today, I want you to know you are so welcome here. At the very heart of it, Christians are people of a promise. We are falling in love with a God who promises that he sent his only son that by what he has done, we can experience eternal life and life to the full. And here's Peter. And here's what I found after being in a few moments with people who are experiencing their last moments on earth. Here's what I found, that when someone is close to death, they usually say some of the most important things about life. And here's the big message Peter wants to show us. If you want a great life, you have to be honest about the threats you are facing. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible reveals that the greatest threat isn't just a what. The greatest threat is a who. Let's begin reading together in chapter 2, verse 1. Peter warns his friends. He says, false prophets also arose among the people. He's talking about the old days. 
Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Just a light summer text. Today, we are gonna understand what God says about his promise. We are also gonna see the links God will go to, to protect his promise. And before we go any further, let's invite him into the room today. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your amazing love for us. Thank you for the word that comes to life. God, we are people who believe that when we open the Bible, you open your mouth. Won't you speak to us today? Give us hope. Show us your power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. So I'm going to attempt to do two things today. The first thing is I want to dig into the text. Now, I hate it when preachers get up and go, whoo, this is a challenging text. But that being said, whoo, this is a challenging text. So first, I just want to walk us through and make sure that we learn what we need to learn. And then towards the end, I'm going to show you for, for what the Bible says, what we need to do about what we've learned. So let me unpack this passage. Who is Peter talking about? He's not talking about some anonymous threat or a hypothetical group of people. They're gonna come in and steal the message of the gospel. No, he's talking about a very specific group of people. He's referring to a new threat that was emerging in the early church, a traveling group of ministers who claimed to be Christian. They were piggybacking off the fame of Jesus to build a name for themselves. Aren't you glad that never happens today? And here's the problem with their teaching is a lot of it sounded really good. Look at verse two. It says, many will follow their sensuality. All because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Here's what Peter was diagnosing as the this most severe problem in the early church, that there was a group of teachers who would reject what Jesus said about sexuality. And after they got people to reject what Jesus says about sexuality, the people began to just start rejecting Jesus. It's a progression that we still see in our world every single day. You know why? It's because Jesus came to make noise. Jesus of the Bible is a revolutionary. He was bold. He was dynamic. He was kind. He's extraordinary. And to this day, he is history's most compelling figure. And one thing that I found in all walks of life is that even when people have gotten tired of religion, people really like Jesus. People really want to know Jesus. My wife and I spent six and a half years in downtown Portland, Oregon, where we got to start a church that's still there today, reaching people and changing lives. And part of our ministry is we did a lot of one-on-one conversations, and we would track those conversations so that we could learn how to love our city better. We got to talk to 6,000 people one-on-one, and one of the questions we would always ask is, what do you think about Jesus? And we found that in America's least religious city, 96% of people really like Jesus. 96% of people in America's least religious city say, hey, when it comes to Jesus, I'm a fan. But here's the problem. Jesus never came just to inspire fans. Jesus came to call genuine followers. And when you really know Jesus, something will start to change. I guarantee you that when you really want to know Jesus and you spend time with Jesus, something will start to change. There's only two options. Number one, by his grace, by his power, by his love, and by his spirit, Jesus starts changing you. Or you will start trying to change Jesus. And here's the problem, it doesn't work. Because a Jesus that looks more like you than the Jesus of the Bible, that Jesus is a false God. And false gods 
can't save you. False gods cannot love you back. False gods cannot protect your family. False gods can't forgive your sins. And false gods never keep their promises. Let's continue in verse three as we begin to understand the strategy of these exploiters. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. You're about to hear the lion wake up in this text. The Bible gives us these two gorgeous images for Jesus, that he is the lamb that was slain for our sins. But the Bible never ignores the fact that he is the lion who protects the one he loves. You're about to hear the lion roar. Are you ready? I just want to point out quickly that the Bible always makes clear that there's a difference between being a wrong teacher and a false teacher. See, a wrong teacher might be doing their best, but they had a little bit too much weed spray the night before, and they might say something that they would go and edit later. A wrong teacher corrects their mistakes. A wrong teacher is open to rebuke. Here at Stone Creek, every time someone's gonna preach on this stage for two weeks, they're meeting with people who love them, people who say, let's hear your notes. Let's hear what God is teaching you. Let's pray over this. They're giving insight. They're giving reproof. They're giving correction. And then the week after, same. So like we are working and preaching in a community of people who have insight into what gets up on this platform. We are changed and formed by one another. It's like a small group come to life. That's our goal. So it's not just one person getting up here, going rogue. There's a difference between a wrong teacher and a false teacher. Here's who a false teacher is. A false teacher is someone who knows better and does it anyway. A false teacher is there for his benefit, not your benefit. And Peter is prosecuting a case. You know how anybody love hanging out with old people? Some of you are like, well, that's just me. <laughs> I'm 40 next year. I'm joining the ranks officially. Here's one thing I've learned about old people is um, sometimes they just really tell you what they think, and it's entertaining. <laughs> In the rest of the world, they might call them rude. Here in the South, we call them eccentric. And uh, Peter is going to tell you exactly what he thinks about these false preachers, these people who are sexually exploiting the weak, warping the gospel, and making money off of it. Here's what he says. Verse 12. But these, like irrational animals, are creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, they will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, revealing in their deceptions while they feast with you. This is not the problem outside the church. These are people who've made it to the table. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. The next time somebody asks you to read a passage of scripture at their wedding, I submit this. <laughs> you know, for a long time, I practiced a kind of Christianity that really didn't know how to deal with texts like this. As I was preparing for a message like this, I was like, come on, it's June. Can't I have a psalm? Can I lift people up? You know what the Bible says? The only way that God can lift people up truly is if you cut away the things that are dead. There is nothing more uplifting than a passage that shows you how to walk in freedom and stay that way. I, I deal with folks all the time and the, one of the questions I get is something like this, but like, what is all this harsh language for? Like, did Peter get it wrong? Doesn't Jesus love sinners? So that must mean that Jesus somehow found a way to ignore sin. 
And that's only because we have ruined the word love. Does Jesus ignore sin? A good therapist will tell you there's a big difference between ignoring and forgiving. There's this feeling that some of us have, like if we have an issue or a problem in our life, maybe we're in conflict with somebody, maybe we did something that we really don't wanna take accountable, accountability for, we can just ignore it and it will go away. Does that ever work? If you ignore something, does it go away? No, usually if you ignore something, it starts to eat away. Have you ever dropped food in your car and just ignored it in the summer? What happens next? I have three kids. If you wanna see what that smells like, meet me in the parking lot after church. Forgotten things fester. We live in a world that wants us to forget about sin. We live in a world that wants us to ignore sin. We live in a world that tells us we're not supposed to talk about sin. Can I tell you, if we don't talk about sin, we'll never get to the best part what? There's a good part about sin? Well, hang on. Let me tell you the rest of the story because I'm so glad Jesus doesn't ignore sin. I'm so glad that the Bible teaches us that God sees the truth about sin, that sin isn't just a list of naughty behaviors. Sin is a condition that seeks to kill sin steal and destroy. The Bible says that Jesus doesn't ignore sin. Jesus saw your sin so that he could carry it all the way to the cross. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin so that we can know the righteousness of God. Jesus saw your sin so he could pay the price for sin so you can live in freedom. Jesus doesn't ignore sin. Jesus died to forgive sin, and Jesus calls us to a new life free from sin. That's the promise of God. And the only reason Jesus is the only one who can make that promise is he's the only one who did what he did for you. Your sins have been paid for. When is the last time you really felt free? And this is the part of the text where things get interesting because what Peter is teaching in this is pretty simple, but the way he teaches it is pretty theatrical. You know those people who are extra? Here's what Peter is teaching. The gospel is God's great promise and God fiercely protects his promise. He always has and he always will. In this passage, Peter gives us four examples from biblical history that shows us that God has the power and the passion to protect his promise for you and me. You see, if this idea of Jesus who can save a sinner, who can find the runaway, who can love the unlovable, who can bring the spiritually dead to life, if this idea is the only hope of the world, then shouldn't the one who gave us that idea protect it with all that he has? And the Bible says he always has and he always will. He gives us four examples Let me just give you an illustration of why I think this is so powerful. There's a news story that came out in January of this year, 2023. And instead of me just reporting the facts, I want you to put yourself in these shoes. What would happen if you're a parent of a small child that just has a cough that won't go away? So finally, you go out of your way and you get medicine that has been recommended to you and you give the child the medicine but the medicine that promised a cure was contaminated. And the very thing that you thought would bring relief caused your child to die. And that's a real tragedy in the world right now. It's a pending case. And it's tragic if all of that happened by accident. But how would you feel if you found out that it wasn't an accident, it was negligence, that somebody cut a few corners so they can make a little more profit? Ooh, I think that you would wanna stop that with a fierce response. Here we are going to see that God saves his most ferocious anger for those who twist his promises so they can profit off of bad ideas. 
He gives four examples of fallen angels, a fallen world, a fallen city, and a fallen prophet. Let's let the word speak for itself. Here's what he says about the fallen angels. Verse four, for a God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Let's see what he says about a fallen world. Verse five, he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse six, let's see what he says about a fallen city. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And then he illustrates why he had such judgment on the city, verse 10, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So according to this text, it says the sin of Sodom was people were sleeping with whoever they wanted to and they hated anybody, including God, who told them to stop. But I wanna be clear of the purpose of 2 Peter. Peter makes a case and he says, I'm not telling you this to preach a message of judgment. The point of this story isn't to tell you who God punished. The point of the story is to remind you who God protected. Look at verse nine. He basically says, I've given you all these illustrations to show you that if you're trusting God to save you, he's good for it. If you're trusting God's mighty power to defend you, he has what it takes. Verse nine says, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. I want you to know who loves you today, but I also want you to know that in a world filled with evil, in a world filled with traps, in a world filled with bad ideas, God is the one who loves you and he's also the one who protects you. Peter sharing all of this to build his case. And in verse 19, he gives the most searing indictment of false teachers. Because somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm like, you know, I know Jesus is the best way. But am I convinced it's the only way? When I'm in a room like this, I say, absolutely. But I'm out in the world and someone starts to tell me about this way of life and a way of living, and it starts to plant some seeds in my mind. These ideas start to spread. Is it really that bad? And Peter said, here's why it's so bad. Here's the indictment of false teachers. Here's why. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Peter says at the end of the day, the worst part of these false teachers is what they're saying doesn't even work. In fact, they never meant it to work for you. Be careful of people who wanna give you permission to indulge your desire whenever you want to instead of inviting you to inherit new desires. Beware of the people who give you what you think you want when you want it because they're not doing it for you, they're doing it for them. But the Bible says it won't even work for them. The reason they can't offer you freedom is because they don't have freedom. When's the last time you really felt free? You know, we as a human population, We have this history of reaching out for remedies that later we find out were worse than the original problem. Let me give you one of the most glaring examples I found of this from the 1900s. So pretend that your kid has a toothache. There's a new remedy on the market. Let's take a look at a real advertisement. Do you have some tooth pain? Try cocaine. (laughs) Cocaine for children. And if you call now, we'll double your offer. But we know, and it's so obvious to see, the remedy is worse than the problem. Sure, the the temporary feeling of pain might go away, but there's a new pain that sets in. And you know why our world can feel so broken even in churches? 
is because we have mostly Jesus, but not all Jesus. We've believed 90% of his idea, but there's still 10% of the world's idea that we wanna try. Some of us still carry around some of these bad ideas, and the, the truth of the matter is they're selling an empty promise. Why am I telling you all this today? Not to bring you down, to lift you up. You know why? Because the Bible calls you to be resilient. You know, Jesus never called his disciples to endure the world. He called his disciples to change the world. Resilient people change the world. Resilient people have something different than blind optimism. Have you ever met those people? Everything's gonna always be fine. Nothing bad will ever happen. Say your prayers, do right, serve, give. Nothing bad will ever happen. The only problem with that is life is a powerful teacher. See, we have the world's most precious treasure and our enemy hates it. And he's gonna come for us. I'm not saying that to scare you because here's the truth. Resilient believers don't walk into the world with blind optimism. We walk into the world with clear-eyed hope. Resilient people say this, the battle will be challenging, but my God is fighting for me. Resilient disciples say, the threat is real, but my God has overcome. What do we need to learn today? That God fiercely protects his promise. Let me make this personal. That means that if you are a child of his promise, God is fiercely protecting you. How does that change your Monday? When you walk out into a world that's coming against you, know that you don't have to defend God because God is defending you. To know that your identity is secure in the one who will never be overcome, that your freedom was purchased by the price that only he can pay, that your joy will be protected and new every morning and your destiny is to be with God forever. Man, that changes things. I want you to know what you're up against so you know that Christ can overcome. So that's what we had to do. We had to figure out what we had to learn. Secondly, in our few moments left, what do we need to do about this? The first thing I wanna invite you to do, just as your friend and as a pastor, number one, I invite you that in a world full of lies, teach yourself to crave the truth. Teach yourself to crave the truth. I used to pray for my kids that they would do the right thing. Now you know what I pray? God, I pray they would be hungry for you. God, I pray they would want you more every day. God, I pray that they would be so satisfied by good things that they would never be thirsty for bad things. God, teach us how to crave the truth. Can I tell you, this can get really practical. How do you make this practical? Bring your Bible to awkward places. <laughs> Bring your Bible and open it up in the middle of confusing conversations. When you face an issue that you don't know how to face, search the word of God. Get friends to help you find verses that point your way forward. Print them out, put them on your phone, look at the truth and then do it. I'm telling you, even as a dad, this has gotten practical. Um, recently, I mean, just this week, I had a kid wake up late at night that's not always when I'm feeling my most spirit-filled. And uh, they came downstairs, I'm so scared, I can't go to sleep. And uh, that's the moment where like, I wanna rebuke him in the name of the Lord. My wife was like, don't you, mm, don't do it. And so I was like, here we are, we're in this. And, and I went to that place of like, yes, okay, I can fix this problem. I can talk you out of your fears. I can reason you out of this. And you can imagine how that went. And finally it hit me, you know what we ought to do? We ought to get the word of life that God has given us to shine a light to our feet. And so I said, let's just get the Bible out in the middle of this moment. Let's open it up. And we began to read scripture together. You know, the Bible says that we're in the middle of a battle and God has given us armor, but the only offensive weapon we have been given in the armor of God is the word of God. It's amazing how quickly God's truth cuts through the world's lies. Resilient people crave God's truth. There's a second thing, it's a progression. 
You can't just know the truth. You have to walk in the truth and expose lies. We are called in culture, in love, to know the teachings of Jesus and to teach the teachings of Jesus. In fact, in Matthew 28, before his ascension into heaven, beside the right hand of God, Jesus said, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And when you begin to believe about God's word, what he believes, that this is the source of life, not the obstacle of life, then you will be excited to show others how they can have freedom too. And the third thing is to find practical ways to enjoy the freedom of knowing Jesus. I wonder if you have somebody in your life that asks you on a regular basis, how are you and God doing? We do this a lot in our staff meetings because believe it or not, the work of church can get busy. And sometimes it seems like you're working for God and you forget that he's in the room. And so we try to discipline ourselves that if we're gonna live this out, if we're gonna preach this, if we're gonna teach other people to do this, then we wanna make space for us to enjoy him too. See, the promise of God is the presence of God. Who is in your life to help you enjoy the presence of God. Find practical ways to enjoy the freedom of knowing him. Because when you're satisfied with something good, you won't be thirsty for something bad. Precious person, I believe in the life God has offered to you. The threat is real, but the power overcomes. Resilient people show up to life knowing the battle belongs to the Lord. Here's how not to feel from a message like this. Ooh, I'm so burdened by the world. Let's talk about how bad it is. Scream and holler, that's right. No, here's an appropriate response. I feel burdened for the world, but I never, no, never feel threatened by the world. That's what it means to be resilient. It's not because of what I can do. It's because of what Christ is doing in us and through us. Have you ever seen those people feel like they have to get real defensive about faith? They get angry and suddenly it looks like a bickering back and forth. Can I just tell you, it's hard to get really defensive when you're aware of how well you are being defended. God fiercely protects his promise. And if you're a child of his promise, the King of Kings, the Lord of hosts, the author of time, the conqueror of the grave. If you're a child of his promise, he is fiercely defending you. Peter references a letter in 2 Peter that a friend of his wrote to a church in Rome. It's called the Book of Romans. I wanna read you as we close a blessing from that letter. In chapter eight of Romans, Here's what he writes. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What does God want from you? Love. What does God want for you? All things. Verse 37, knowing all these things. And all of these things. You see how crazy it's getting out there? And all of these things. Did you hear the new lies that are getting popular? And all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know what Jesus wants from you? He wants you. You have no imagination to the depths of his love for you. You have no imagination to even comprehend the links he went to for you. And that story is the world's best idea. It's the gospel. 
The gospel is God's promise. And because the gospel changes the world, make no mistake, God protects his promise. Can we have a moment of response if you would bow your head and close your eyes? Where is God speaking to you today? I regularly need a moment like this and an invitation. What bad idea needs to be exposed in your heart today? The bad idea that you're unlovable, lie. That you're unforgivable, lie. That you'll always be stuck, it's a lie. That God has given up on you, lie. That it can work for everybody else, but not for you, that's a lie. That God will stop chasing after them, that's a lie. That you have to find your own way to God, it's a lie. One of the greatest ways to defeat a lie is to stand with people who speak truth over you, who pray truth over you. In just a moment, our prayer team is gonna come forward and maybe somebody here today, you need prayer for yourself or somebody that you love, that God's truth would win the day, that their heart would be softened, that your heart would be softened, that a life would be changed. God wants to change lives and he always wants to start with you. I wonder if there's a person in this room that if you're honest, you would say, I don't know if I am a child of God's promise. I mean, I've been around faith for a long time, but I don't know if I've ever gone all in with God. I wonder if today could be that day to step into this life. We've been talking about the gospel, but here it is. The Bible says that there is a God and he is good. The Bible says there's a problem and it's sin. Oh, but here's the good part. There is a hope and his name is Jesus. And here's the part maybe you need today. There is a response and it is surrender.